okay so let's let's start uh, this um, first day of um, of the fit for ri final virtual summit so our final conference um so we will have uh, three days of, of conference or uh, three mornings um and welcome everyone to this first day so um, i just want to highlight some um, housekeeping uh, information about the the way that we are going to organize um our our um, sessions so all the event will be recorded and um and the presentations and the, the recordings will be available in our in in the in the event uh, in the event page the, where we have all the information about the program and also um all the details to to join the different uh, zoom sessions um by default we have all all, all microphones off um from the from the participants you can also turn on turn on or turn off your your camera um i think it's it's better during the at least the keynote presentation is better if you can turn off your uh, your webcam and then later you can uh, you can um, enable your your camera so to to participate okay you can use the chat if you want to 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 put questions you can do it in chat or if you want to exchange any any comment during the presentations with other participants you can interact with the, via chat this is a normal uh, zoom meeting room um during this uh, this conference we will use also a webinar uh, zoom room for a, a, another session but this is a normal uh, uh, zoom meeting room in order to to allow more participation if you if you want to speak you just need to raise uh, the, your hand it's close to the chat and the, um, the participants list you have the possibility to raise a hand and then you you can uh, turn on your microphone and camera to to put the question or to make any any comments so we will have um after the keynote presentation we will have a, a moment for um uh, questions and answers um, so you will be able to to join and to participate in the discussion um use uh, the hashtag rri for real uh, to to discuss also in the in the social media this uh, this event if you want to also to, to make a mention to to the project um, twitter account you can also do it or just use the hashtag in the different uh, social media channels okay we are more focused on on twitter but uh, you can also use it in other uh, channels so welcome to this uh, first um, uh, first day of our final summit today it's a uh, it's a uh, it's it's the our um, first day of the conference and dedicated to the, the RRI culture and skills uh, and and for that we have three sessions uh, four sessions sorry um, because we have two parallel sessions and an interactive interactive session after the the, the parallel sessions and we open with this um, first session where we have our coordinator Andrea Riccio to open the um, the conference and, and to welcome you to this final conference and then um uh, kemal kemal Hassan, um as a keynote uh, to have a provocative uh, <laughs> a keynote to 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 set up and to start the the discussion uh, around these uh, issues oh, today focus on rri culture and skills so andrea the floor is yours um the kickoff of our conference is then so please join me and um hi welcome uh to this uh, to to our final conference yeah thank you pedro and thank you everybody for being here well i'm pretty excited i don't know if it would have been even more exciting being present we tried a lot but for safety reason we decided then to have a virtual conference so uh, I will start sharing my screen in a few moments. Here we are. Because I really don't want to talk about the project. Because you will hear 
you will hear a lot about the project from my colleagues that really work in the heart on this. I just want to, to share with you some keywords and some key message that we really developed during this almost four years project because in the, at the end we had an extension of the project of six months trying to be in presence as I said. Um, so, well, let's start. When we started thinking about working on our end of science, we had, since the very first moments, it was back to 2016, just one simple idea in mind, that science, as all the big institutions of the last century, has entered a phase of deep crisis in terms of trust and reputation, exactly as it was happening to all the big institutions and this crisis could have been caused, we really didn't have any answer and probably we don't have it even now, uh, by as the results of some interacting factors such as globalization from one side but also individualism on the other and also the idea of, well, the upcoming of new way of socializing and asking for a greater collective engagement in societal relevant matters. We thought that responsible research and innovation and open science could be the answer to overcome and manage the social transformation that we were seeing affecting science and innovation. But at the same time, we know pretty well that we should move from an abstract and I would say also somehow romantic way of looking at responsibility that could be beautiful maybe, but not necessarily useful, towards a more concrete approach of responsibility, grounded solidly in research funding and performing organization, and capable of deeply involving scientists' main actors to foster a process of real institutional change. We really were thinking about these and we were trying to find out the element of a proposal and on a way of seeing the future of science that could represent this potential answer and especially this inner idea that we had. Well, sorry. <laughs> well, our design receipt was based so on some clear pillars. The first one too was the desire to engage and put into relation all the actors involved in science and innovation according to a quadruple helix approach. So to bring together the academia, but also the industrial sector together with policymakers and citizens, but also to address relevant scientific issues through real use cases, so to ground solidly in reality our RRI and the approach basic need on co-creation. We also wanted to foster transdisciplinarity, spreading the word of responsibility also in those sectors and in those disciplines that usually are not very keen to, like the hard sciences. We also wanted to promote transparency and openness by producing open tools and resources that could be available for the growing responsibility and openness community. And in the end, we wanted also to focus on the governance dimension of organization in order to pave the way for real institutional change supported by responsibility and openness. We tried, I think even successfully, to reproduce this structure in our way of working and so in our work, work plan. So we can say that Fit for RRI is based on three main strengths, we can define it as strengths, that helped us in developing our idea. The first one is an analysis trend. And we tried to work package one and work package two to see what was happening. So the state of the art in terms of RRI in different sectors and in different countries. Then we moved to a testing phase where we tried to test possible solution through co-creation experiments, and especially to develop also training tools to support these real cases. And in the end, we work on production. So we work concretely on promoting changes through guidelines for governance. 
each day of the conference is dedicated to one of these trends. So today we will start for the other right, with the other right culture and skills. Then we will move to the part concerning more the institutional change. And in the very end, we will work on other right policies. So seeing how it is important to look at different steps and to have a con con concrete process towards real change. Well, this is in a few words, I hope not to be long, how and why we decided to work on Fit for RRI. But the real idea is that this conference, which is based on shaping the future of open science and society relation, is not just an occasion to tell you how we worked, because, well, this will not be useful in our mind. This is supposed to be a collective gathering to keep working on the future of RRI and open science, because this is our urgency beyond the outcomes of the next forthcoming European framework program. And to this, we will also talk with the European Commission in the last day of the conference, try to understand how to shape this future. But, and so my idea is that indeed the best is yet to come, because I feel the start, and I think that all the Fit for RRI members, and I'm sure also you, feel that this is the start of a new phase that involves the entire RRI and open science community of practice. We want to, brick, to build upon the bricks of our project and another similar one, because we are in contact with many of you, and your presence here is uh, testify this, in order to try to contribute to develop a novel paradigm for science that nowadays has to be open, inclusive, reflective, and socially engaged. I want to thank all of you, and especially to thank the Fit for Right Consortium, because it's hard to find that such a great partners to, to spend three years together discussing a lot and working a lot, because without them, this project wouldn't be possible. Thanks to everybody. And now I think that I can leave the floor to our keynote speaker for the first day, Kemal Lazen. Good morning. And I'm glad to have him here. Thanks, Kemal, for being here. Good morning. I'm assuming everybody can hear me. Yes, perfect. Yeah. Thank Lovely. You. Um, well, well, first, um, good morning again. Uh, I'd like to echo what uh, Andrea has just said and extend a warm welcome to you all, wherever you are. Um, I'd also like to uh, uh, thank Pedro for his introductory comments uh, as well. My name's Kumar Lassen and uh, Andrea asked me to help kickstart the day with a few introductory words. Um, I'm just going to talk for about 10 minutes or so. Uh, admittedly, I find Zoom quite painful, so hopefully it won't be too painful for you to listen to me. But before I start, I need to enter a couple of caveats. First, and I remember I was looking at Andrea's um, poster in the background, I'm not an RRI expert. I'm probably more of a critical friend or an observer. Second, I've taken the liberty of changing the content of my presentation. It's over seven months since the original date of the conference in Rome, and at the risk of stating the obvious, a lot has happened since then. Rather than structure my talk around the original themes of a retrospect and prospect of RRI and the fit for RRI program in particular, I want to highlight some things that I have observed in relation to the pandemic and tie them into the debate about where RRI might go. Third, my approach is a mix of rhetorical and controversial. I think Pedro made reference to that. I will therefore leave you to take up any relevant issues in your work and in the conference over the next few days. And finally, as I think is quite obvious now, um, I do not have any slides or presentation notes to beguile you with. So as a starting point, I want to highlight the role of science and research in the current debate on dealing with COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic. First, one of the most dominant themes in the public debate has been the idea that decisions are led by the science. What we seem to have forgotten in the debate, however, is the infallibility of science and research. 
That is, have we leveled with the public about the reality of how science and research can or cannot help us predict the future and control the world? Here, there is an obvious issue of responsibility in and among the research community. Second, are all disciplines and research participating equally in the debate about the pandemic? Granted, there is a need for modeling, but I'm still waiting for a more open debate about epistemology or even ontology. Because there has been a tendency in the narrative about tackling COVID-19 to adopt the language of war, it seems apparent that some of these issues for debate have been ignored or sidelined for the indefinite future. Third, I have been amazed and truly grateful for the sacrifice of many people to help us try and deal with the numerous issues that the pandemic has thrown up, from clinical to economic. But at the same time, and this is perhaps my controversial point, I've thought that at times some colleagues in the research community have allowed themselves to be hijacked by other stakeholders, such as politicians, for example. Now, these three observations are not exhaustive, but in terms of RRI, they highlight two important subplots for me. The first is about power. Who has the power when dealing with a pandemic and how is it being distributed? Is power something you possess or is it relational? Critically, does the research community have any power? Second, who have been the agents of change in tackling some of the issues around the pandemic? Have there been any agents within the research community and are these individual or collective? Fundamentally, the question these raise is how has RRI been relevant? Now I want to turn to RRI itself. Definitions of RRI seem to cover different components, public and societal engagement, open access, gender equality, ethics, science education, and governance. And these seem to involve the four main stakeholders of academia, citizens, government, and industry. I think in an earlier slide, we made reference to the, the idea of a quadruple helix. Now, the temptation when thinking about RRI or the Fit for RRI program is to look simply at the outputs that have been delivered. For example, the reports that have been uploaded on the website or indeed this conference itself. For me, the relevance of RRI or the Fit for RRI program is not with outputs, but with outcomes and impacts. Now, admittedly, people often struggle to understand the difference between an outcome and an impact. This is because the terms are sometimes used interchangeably and are often provided without any definition. For what we are seeking to do, it might be easier to think of outcomes as the things that you will be measuring, for instance, changes for your citizens or organizations, and impacts as the things that other people will be measuring, for example, changes in headline statistics that local authorities or health agencies may record. Now, the relevance for us is simple. I want you to consider what have been the outcomes and impacts you have been delivering, both through this program and your day-to-day -day work. Now, moving forward, I want to bring the different things I've highlighted, the observations about COVID, the two subplots around power and agency, and the need to move from focusing simply on outputs and looking to outcomes in, and impacts and start thinking about the future. First, the most obvious thing is to ensure that we do not think about RRI and indeed open science as a program, discipline or a subject. In fact, in many ways, we need to ensure we avoid thinking about RRI as an end in itself. Here we must not see the demise of Horizon funding streams as something sad, but the opening up of an opportunity. And again, making reference to Andrea's last slide, the best is yet to come. Second, we need to have some honest discussion on epistemology, truth and knowledge in the research and innovation community. And in parallel, think about how this has translated into the outcomes and impacts we are trying to achieve. Where and when we have these discussions is still open to debate, but they are needed ever more so. Third, I think we need to celebrate our greatest achievement to date, creating a sense of community. Here we have started the process of recognizing common interests and working out what people care about. What we now need to do is think about how this translates into power and how we can act as agents of change. Here, I want you to ask yourself, 
Was participating in the Fit for RRI program worth it? And if so, how are you measuring the benefits and how can these be used in the future? Now, the last point is one of optimism. And I would love to end my comments here on that note. But I have to end with a note of caution around where and when responsibility ends in research and innovation and revisit the issue of power and agency again. Take, for instance, GDPR. Rightly, there has been a lot of emphasis on privacy and protecting the interests of the public. And I know from first-hand experience that there has been quite a bit of effort by companies, for example, to comply with GDPR rules. But is it really relevant, given the immense power of data and the hundreds, indeed thousands of data points that are being monitored and scraped for information? Put differently, does big data really need access to my medical records to know my medical condition and well-being? Or take the growing field of emotion analytics, where automated technology is being used to read our emotions. Now, the automatic sentiment analysis in the WILD project was a Horizon-funded project a few years back. Its main name, and I'm going to take this directly from the website, is to deploy and capitalize on existing state-of-the-art methodologies, models, and algorithms for machine analysis of facial, vocal, and verbal behavior, and then adjust and combine them to realize naturalistic, human-centric, human-computer interaction, and computer-mediated face-to-face interaction. Now, granted, that is a bit of a mouthful. And clearly, this research has commercial value. In fact, this is probably one of the reasons they have been successful in attracting funding and finance. And my understanding is that this project has been successfully spun out commercially. Put differently, it is an absolute goldmine for digital marketeers. Now, I have not read the terms and conditions of, the, of the, the use of this Zoom platform. Like most of you today, I clicked on a couple of buttons to provide me access. But it is quite possible, indeed probable, that our emotions are being captured, read and analysed as we discuss this morning, and potentially for a marketing opportunity in the future. Now, for me, these two examples highlight how our futures are being shaped for us, through research and innovation. Finally then, if this is the case, how is RRI relevant and what can we do as researchers and innovators to ensure that our futures are shaped positively? On that note, I will end. Thank you. Thank you, Kemal. Well, I think that you raised the a lot of questions, a lot of like open questions and a lot to, to discuss about. So I have some like curiosity about your talk, but I would like to hear the audience before. If there is any question from the audience, please raise your hand. I will try to, to give you the floor. You scared them, come on. Or if you want to write something in the chat. Okay. Well, so I will start. For example, I will use the pandemic as an example in the, of the role of the scientific community, both in terms of powers, but also in terms of responsibility. Because as you were saying, Sometimes science had to like lose, lost his power in favor of like policy making and so on in this pandemic. While they should be, while it should be like the most representative topic. But on the other hand, at least what, from what I'm seeing in the Italian debate, for us science was more or less medicine. While on the other hand. Maybe because I am somehow RRI biased, I do believe that like scientific task forces working on the issues of a pandemic such as the COVID-19 should be really interdisciplinary, should engage especially anthropologists and social scientists and so on, because apart from being a big like sanitary crisis, this pandemic is especially a social crisis and not only a sanitary and an economic one. 
How do you think that? Uh, what do you think about this? I wasn't expecting to have to answer questions. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I think I, I made reference to this issue that some of the disciplines that we've talked about um, are not being heard. And, and certainly if I was to take the, the, the UK as an example, we've had a lot of emphasis on, for instance, the modeling. And this is not to undermine the, the, the amazing work the modelers are doing, but I think, Andre, you made reference to anthropology. One of the things that struck me is that we have been the behavioral scientists, for instance, in this debate. Why are our politicians scratching their head that actually people are not following the rules and regulations? So, so I, think, I think you made reference to the need to engage with hard science. And I think, I think we have to accept that in times of crisis, there is possibly a... Um, I don't know what the word is, but I, I suppose there is a sense of kind of priorities in terms of focusing on, around the clinical, the medical aspect, but also thinking about some of the economic. But, but I think what I would look to, there, therefore, is that people who are representing, for instance, the, the clinical, the, the hard sciences should also themselves try and reach out to the other disciplines and not, not, let, other, not let the other stakeholders within this quadruple helix um, um, steer the debate. So I think there's, there, I think there's, a, there, there's something internally for us to think about. Okay, how does the hard science? And I'm always uncomfortable with that term. You know, how do we open up discussions, for instance, around, you know, artificial intelligence and you know how we nudge people's behaviour. You know, we, we need we need to think about that. I think just one final comment. It, it's worth saying. I, I suppose why I was making reference to my note of caution. Um, a lot of big business out there is already doing this. Uh, I mean, if you look at the kind of big data, the whole big data where big data is going, I mean, they, they understand this perfectly. Why we are struggling in terms of a track and trace and trying to understand the modeling and linking the modeling is something about our institutions. But, but we have to accept that there are other um, stakeholders within this quadruple helix who understand the need to, for interdisciplinarity. So, so how we learn from them, I don't know. Um, but we better do it pretty quickly or they'll just take us over. Okay, thank you, Kamal. We have another question in the chat from Ron Ipofen. He says, and I'm looking for your comment, we all know that science has limits. There is a great deal of uncertainty in scientific outcomes. How can that best be presented in public forums so that all confidence is not lost? That's a good one. Thanks, Ron. I suppose, I mean, I don't want to answer that question. I, I'm going to push that question back to you because you, 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 in a way you stated the really obvious challenge that you as RRI experts have to address. So, so Andrea, I'm going to push that question to, to you. And, and given the experience of the last three or four years, how would you um, address that issue? Well, that's not easy because, for example, going back to pandemic, because, well, it influenced a lot its life. One of my open question is how the science community could prevent fake news. Should they be part, an active part of preventing fake news or just they have to, to give their job well? And, who, who others, who, which other actors should intervene in terms of fake news? It's an open question. What is important is that situation like this put again, even if not as much as it should, science in the middle. And this is a very good chance to try to recover confidence and somehow, I guess at least in the Italian context, this happened. We started to see again, scientists at least, but there is still a long, way to do and I really don't have at the moment a clear answer but there are a lot of questions for you so I'm going to read the one that you received. Fabio Faudo say very interesting what you said about the sense of community again connected to RRI and what this means in terms of power and opportunity to activate change. Could you please elaborate more on that? Then we have Emma Harris that say 
there has been an argument that COVID has actually increased the acceptance of open science and level right principles and tools, for example, preprints, science communication, rapid reviews, and so on. How can we keep any positive momentum that we have gained? And in the end, uh, Antonella Camisa asked to you, Kemal, in your opinion, uh, are negationists, for example, in the UK, against science or politics? Hmm, tricky one. Did you take notes? Okay. So yeah, I've, I've, I've taken notes. Sorry, You're really making me work this morning. I thought this was going to be kind of easy with my coffee and brioche and... Uh, okay. Um, well, well let, let me look at the... Let me... Um, I, I, let me make. Let me comment on the second uh, uh, question first. In uh, what Emma? Um, I mean, I mean, I think there is a, there is a, you know, there is a. If you read certain newspapers, you know, one would get the impression um, that actually uh, there is now some positive momentum um, around. Uh, I mean, and I mean, I'm, I'm feel now. Reg I, I have a slight regret that this is. Not, this is not to be a COVID-19 conference and what the role of RRI is. So, so, so I think we need to also put that into perspective. Um, but but I, think, I think certainly if you read some elements of, of the press, there, there clearly has been some positive momentum in terms of um, actually how we see the role of science um, w w within or how we tackled the, the debate. Um, I, I, would say that, I would say that it would be quite interesting to, 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 to get a feel for... Um, for Joe Public's sense of um, what this all means. So, so when we have the, the images of, you know, Brighton or Bournemouth Beach that are full of people and they've, they've, been, they've been given the advice, the scientific advice, and they've totally ignored it. So um, I, I, would, I would hope that Emma is right. Uh, personally, I don't see that. Um, and certainly not when I see the, the, the daily briefings or the weekly briefings, I, I, I don't get the, the, the sense of that. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not gonna. That's that's not gonna happen. Um, I, I mean, there is clearly something that that's in parallel, which I think ha, has is important for the science and research community, and that's in terms of actually how we're do, dealing with some of the some of the, I guess, uh, effects of the, the the pandemic. So this kind of low level of anxiety, and and clearly now we're having a debate around mental health and so, so uh, social isolation. Um, but I don't know if that answered that question. I mean, I think I, Emma. I mean, I, I, I hope you're right. Um, I don't feel that. Um, but anyway, let, let, let's let's see. Um, I mean, the the the, the last the, the first question was really about um, communities of practice, um, and, and and I get the sense of actually what 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 we can do. Um, I mean, one of the interesting things is 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 I think amongst the signs, I, I, I do feel that as, you know, we need to create our own communities of practice. And I think we need to have um, uh, honest debates about issues about truth and issues about knowledge. And this, um, I mean, it's interesting that we keep talking about science. Um, and uh, we, there's an always debate around the philosophy of science is actually what do we mean by science? And, and it's no coincidence that when we think about RRI, we're talking about research and innovation. There are clearly other stakeholders, other, other agents that are involved in the discussion around research and innovation that perhaps we haven't kind of engaged with. And, and you know, for me, the most obvious is actually the finance community. You know, do, do we actually engage with in terms of you know, the investors, the funders, the finance in terms of actually, you know, what is the, what is the issue about responsibility for, for them? Um, but I don't know. I mean, I, I, you know, the problem about me is I never know what I think until I've written it down. So I probably need to sit down and think about that. Um, and I might come back to that. Or maybe somebody else will provide a far more intelligent answer to that. I, I mean, the third one was, um, I mean, Andre, can you just kind of just repeat that again for me? The, the, the round, the, the, the third question is. Was... We can't hear you. Here I am. Sorry. The third question was about uh, uh, the negationism of COVID-19 and other issues. Do you think that like these people, for example, from the perspective you have in the UK, are against, are against science or against politics? Um, 
Yeah, I, th I think, I, I think, you know, my sense is people still, you know, we've been talking about the whole public understanding of science, for instance, debate for the last 20 or 30 years. And, and the reality is that although we've had lots of initiatives around citizen science and science with and for, what is it, the, the swaths, and, and as you know, I've been kind of involved in that. Um, Joe Public still doesn't understand actually what is science. I mean, you know, their understanding typically of technology is that bit of kit that they use to turn on their, 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 their TV. So, I mean, there's a whole issue about epistemology and philosophy and, um, and truth and knowledge, which um, the, the public um, does, not, does not know about, perhaps does not need to know about. I guess where my concern is, is that I think we in the research and innovation community haven't leveled with them. We haven't told them that actually we can't solve this problem. We're not, we're not doing that. I mean, we're, 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 in a sense, we're playing God and uh, we're not leveling with, with the public. And I think what is always interesting is that when you, you're quite keen to promote this issue about interdisciplinarity and multidisciplinarity and, um, one of the things that always strikes me, for instance, which is actually different culturally, is, for instance, when you talk to some clinicians in certain countries, they do play as God. And, and given the issues, the, the clinical issues around the pandemic, um, there, is, there, is, um, you know, there is this issue about, you know, culturally how we perceive, for instance, the role of science, um, the role of clinicians in all of that. But, but, uh, but I suppose that, I, I suppose, I think in, in terms of the UK, and I'm not here to represent the UK, yet, because actually I'm not sitting in the UK right now. I, I mean, clearly, I think the, the public are just fed up with everybody. I think they're just fed up with everybody that claims to be an expert or to represent them. And, and so, you know, we have to win the trust back. I don't think that now is finished because I see that René von Schomberg raised his hand. So I will give the floor to René, but we also have a question from Raphael that say, what we talk about, we say power, do we talk about it in the means of political power, which is more or less top down? And is it helpful for responsible science? I would say no, as we would become politicians and stop being scientists. So what could this notion of power to foster the urgently needed change mean? Maybe Foucault's notion of a fluid power shaping discourse could be could help here or not. Keep it in mind, and I give the floor to René von Charmant. Hi, René, welcome. Hi, Andrea. Good to see you. Um, I, I just have a, a small observation. Um, I, 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 you mentioned also in your introduction um, uh, the word uh, trust, and it seems to me that. Uh, it uh, is this called, the concept of trust is rather loosely uh, uh, used in, 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 in various uh, meanings. Um, I think it's important here to distinguish between um, trust in science as such, as a system of information, uh, or you know, science as a functional authority to other spheres of our society, as uh, Nicholas Luhmann, for instance, saw it or trust in expert judgments. And these are two different things, and these two uh, things are also related in a different way to RRI and open science. I think um, science as, as a reliable source of information uh, for other spheres, for decision-making spheres, for example. So the trustworthiness of the scientific system and um, the type of expectations we can have from science to, pro to produce the right type of information which we would need for decision making is a total different issue than trust in expert adjustment. So in this first uh, element, of course, as you already mentioned on COVID, um, this gave open science a real boof, uh, boost because um, we needed, of course, in a short time, a reliable information and 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 it COVID at the same time reveals that our system uh, does not necessarily supply that if we don't uh, operate with the type right type of public governance of science um, and that means that you let um, scientists share uh, and collaborate very early in the process uh, uh, prior to publishing 
Uh, and that means another way of operating science, actually. And this gives really a boost to open science. And um, unfortunately, of course, we see COVID as an uh, exceptional issue. And uh, probably uh, post-COVID, we want to go return to business as usual. But that would be a real pity, of course, in terms of uh, open science as currently operated to a large extent in the COVID realm. So trust in expert judgment, this is a completely different issue. Um, so trust in, I mean, obviously experts uh, operate in, in political arenas and uh, in different policy contexts. And the issue of uh, whether they uh, produce rubbish or uh, sensible uh, questions is, um, is an issue for deliberative democracy. And the way we involve experts um, in advisory committees and so on. So that's an other, uh, an, an other challenge. Uh, I think uh, we, have, we have improved ourselves on that front quite a bit actually in the last uh, few years. But on the first issue, um, we haven't addressed this much. And I think um, with open science, we can um, help to make the science system as such uh, better by having, for instance, addressing also the issue of reproducibility of data. You know, recent, uh, um, recent uh, inter uh, surveys in Nature shows that 70% of the articles published in Nature underlie data which are not reproducible by colleagues. So this is, this is quite significant. Um, and um, I, I will not give a lecture about what is the diagnosis of this. You can read that uh, in, 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 in the books I published, but um, mm. this is an issue which uh, we have to address. And um, mm. this is of a completely different nature than, for example, the, the expert uh, judgment trust, I think, which you predominantly seem to address. So thanks for your attention. Sorry for, for a too long intervention, maybe. Thank you to you, Rene. Your intervention was like, oh, on a right fold on, on the issue of uh, data reproducibility. But thank you because you raised an interesting topic that probably we can also keep working on in the next three days that we have to face. And also in your double interview, we will be back with this. And I don't know if Kemal has some other uh, quick comment on this. No, I, I, think, I think that summed up, I guess, um, quite neatly, uh, some some of the some of the, the bl blurring of boundaries when you uh, you're worried about the post day. It's gone, Andrea. From here, it's gone. It's gone. Say bye bye to it. No, I think I think I think in the same way that you know you, you could ask you could you could raise that question about, for instance, the the, the notion of responsibility as well. So I think I think um, I think, uh, think though no, I don't really have a comment to to that, but that was fine. Okay, so you have still just the last question, which was the question that Rafael made to you about what we talk about when we say power. Did you keep note about this? Did you keep note? Okay, or you want me a quick like a summary of the question? Well, I mean, I mean, power is an interesting thing, um, and and I think you know, I think I'm sure even Renee's probably got some interesting comments about notions of power because I think they they do relate to issues of trust and knowledge. Um, I mean, the, the key thing is in terms of power is to simply think of it in terms of uh, political power. Now, it, it's not a coincidence that I made a reference to, uh, and I'm not a kind of AI or digital expert at all, but as a, as a kind of critical observer, when I look at the power of, I look at the power, for instance, of some of the, the, the large kind of big data out there, it does make me wonder when we, when we, when the European Commission slaps a fine on a particular company, whether it makes any difference. So, so for me, power is not not necessarily something that a politician has. Um, I think power for me, 
also critically is not some, something that is possessed, but it's relational. Now, how we in the research and innovation uh, community um, understand notions of power and where we fit in within this landscape is, is, is I think, important. And, and, I, and I think I go back to that positive note of optimism in terms of, you know, creating a sense of community. You know, in parallel to having a sense of community, there's also a sense of there should be a sense of power and, and how we use that sense of community to affect change. Um, but yeah, that's really my only comment to that. Thank you. So I think that we can like hand up this keynote in this now because Kamal, we really like asked you several things and you were great in answering. <laughs> So thank you again, because in this way we will have time for like distribute the audience among the two parallel sections that will happen now. The first one about the lesson learned from Open Science and RRI, but Pedro has the agenda. So thanks to Pedro, I have to remember everything in my mind. I give the floor to you for keeping like housekeeping. Thanks. Okay. Um... Thank you for this uh, great session and for this um, welcome to our to our conference. So now we will proceed with um, two parallel sessions. Uh, so we we advise you to to please have the the program page open in your in your browser. Check your email because we are moving from Zoom session to another Zoom session. So it's not easy as we have uh, different three different slots during the the day so now we are moving to uh, two parallel sessions our idea was to have a kind of five minutes of um of a break okay uh, you can have a coffee um and then uh, you join before half past uh, 10 the um, the parallel session that you you want to um, participate so uh, I'm uh, adding here to the chat also the, the links of both sessions that you can copy and, um, and use to, to connect. So you have already in the chat the link to both um, parallel sessions, so you can select. So uh, we have um, uh, one parallel session dedicated to the to are going to, to share with you the main uh, outputs and results from uh, fit for ri uh, training um, activities uh, but also uh, we want to 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 do it together with uh, another pro project um, orion open science project both we are both horizon 2020 projects that have started more or less in the same time and and run uh, in parallel our activity so i think it's interesting also to share some of our outputs and some challenges and lessons learned from this process so this session is dedicated to the training activities around rri and open science and then another session dedicated more to uh, ethics so influencing policy making with ethical evidence uh, it's also a collaboration with uh, another um, european project um, Ron Ifofen uh, will support, will moderate, will uh, will um, uh, manage this uh, this session. Uh, so join us for these two parallel sessions. You can uh, you have the the links here. You also have the links in your um, in your email and uh, and then the um, also in the web page of the event. Uh, you, you can also um, you can also access uh, all the the Zoom sessions. So uh, we will close this session uh, in uh, one or two minutes. Um, but you are free to to close the browser and open the other the other session. So stay with us. Don't go for other kinds of activities. Don't check your email. Problems will be solved. <laughs> so join us uh, in in one or two minutes. We are already opening the other rooms and we will start at half past uh, 10, okay? Stay with us. Thank you.